Hi, this is Dom Bettinelli. This episode's topic is the mysterious Voynich Manuscript, and you may have seen some news stories about the manuscript recently. We recorded this episode of Mysterious World before that news broke, but we will have an update addressing those new claims at the end of the show. We went back to the studio and recorded an update with Jimmy's comments on those news stories. So please stick around and be sure to listen for that. Thank you, and on with the show. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 45 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Voynich Manuscript. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Before we begin, folks, remember to share the podcast with your friends, if you can. That would be greatly appreciated. It helps us reach more people. And if you can write a review in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, that pushes the podcast out to be noticed by the people who run those directories and helps promote the show, gets it up on their lists and that sort of thing. So both of those things, sharing and writing review would be greatly appreciated and helps us grow the show. So let's get to today's topic. In 1912, a rare book dealer named Wilfred Voynich visited a Jesuit college where he bought an exceedingly strange book. It was written in an unknown alphabet and contained bizarre illustrations, and he spent the rest of his life trying to decipher it, and it's baffled experts ever since. Today, it is known as the Voynich Manuscript, and that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. First, I want to say this is a patron's episode, right, Jimmy? Yes, that's right. Every month we ask our patrons to select a topic, and this month they've selected the Voynich Manuscript, and so that's what we're doing. This is a a fascinating one. I've been aware of the Voynich Manuscript for a long time, and I'm not surprised that it was the one they picked. So let's start with the man that the book is named for. Who was Wilfred Voynich? Well, he had a really interesting life. I, I, If I can find out more about him, we might do an episode just on his life. <laughs> he was Polish, and he was born in 1865, so that's the year the Civil War ended here in America. But he wasn't born here in America. He was born in Lithuania. He was of Polish ancestry, but he was born in Lithuania. Uh, born in Arizona, moved to Babylon, <laughs> King died. Yeah. Um, at, at the time, though, Lithuania was part of the Russian Empire, like Poland itself tends to be. There hasn't actually been a historical Poland in a lot of periods of time. It tends to be alternately taken over by Germany and Russia. Since it was part, since Lithuania was part of the Russian Empire, Voynich studied chemistry at Moscow University, and he became a pharmacist. Uh, He also became a political revolutionary, advocating Polish independence from Russia. And at age 20, he tried to break some friends out of prison in Warsaw who had been sentenced to death. And they were, I guess, revolutionaries as well. They'd been caught and sentenced to death, and he tried to break them out of prison. But they caught him, and he was sentenced to penal servitude in Siberia. So they shipped him off to Siberia. But when he was 25, he escaped from Siberia and fled to London, where he became not a pharmacist but an antiquarian book dealer, and a very successful one. In 1914, he opened a dealership in New York City, and, you know, he had these revolutionary ties in his past. And in 1917, during World War I, he was investigated by the FBI because he possessed a cipher that had been invented by uh, Sir Francis Bacon. And so they thought he might be doing something shady with the cipher, like doing stuff in code. But but he wasn't, and so he was fine. And he spent, during the war, he spent a lot of his time in New York, but he had time both in London and in New York. And then in 1930, he passed on at age 64. So he came into possession of this manuscript. Who did he buy the book from? He bought it from the Collegio Romano, or Roman College, that had been established by St. Ignatius of Loyola in the 1500s. 
It's now called the Pontifical Gregorian University, or informally it's known as the Greg. At the time, they were short on money, and they decided to sell some of their library to the Vatican Library in 1912. But Voynich was present for the sale, and he ended up buying 30 books for his own dealership. One of them was the Voynich Manuscript. So the sale wasn't just a private sale to the Vatican Library, but a sale, like a used book sale. My sense, and I don't know the details for for sure, but my sense is like, no, we're selling this stuff to the Vatican. But he happened to be there and said, hey, can I get a piece of this action? Mm, interesting. I, I sometimes don't like that when I see old books. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So what what happened to the Voynich manuscript then? He knew he had something really strange on his hands, and so he had bought it in 1915 and in in 1912, and then in 1915, he presented it to the public. He let the public know about it, and then he spent the rest of his life trying to decipher it. When he died 15 years later in 1930, it was inherited by his wife, Ethel Voynich, and when she died 30 years later in 1960, she willed it to a friend of hers named Ann Nill. In 1961, Ann Nill sold it to an antique book dealer, but he couldn't find a buyer. And so he donated it to Yale University in 1969, and that's where it is today. Let's talk about the book itself. What is it like physically? It's about nine inches long and six inches wide and two inches thick. So it's larger than a pocket edition paperback. It's sort of the size of a large trade paperback. It originally apparently had about 270 pages or a little more than that, but some of the pages are missing. And today it has around 240 pages. The reason I have to say around is because it depends on how you count the pages. Some of them are fold outs, like the centerfold in a magazine, which is really unusual for a book. One of the pages even folds out to be like six times the normal size of a page, not in not just in length, but it's like three times as long as a normal page and twice as tall when you unfold it. The pages are made out of vellum, out of calf's hide. And today the book has a goatskin cover, but that seems to have been added by the Jesuits. It appears the book originally had a wooden cover. And the way we know that is because there are insect holes at the front and the back of the vellum. So it's like there was a wooden cover that got eaten by insects, and they also damaged some of the pages. It is not a printed book. All of the letters were handwritten, and the illustrations are hand-drawn and hand-painted. It's written with a brown-black ink, and the pigments in the paint are, it it has white paint, red-brown, green, and blue paint in the illustrations. What is the writing itself like? Well, it looks kind of like cursive penmanship, but the alphabet is unknown. It is not the Latin alphabet. We know it's an alphabet, or at least it presents itself as an alphabet, because there's about 20 to 25 main characters, and there are a few dozen rarer symbols that only occur once or twice each. But that range of like 20 to 25 characters, that's a normal alphabet length. Uh, If it was... 80 or 100 symbols, we'd say it's not an alphabet, it's a syllabary. A syllabary is, it's a writing system that has a different symbol, not for each letter, but for each syllable. Okay. And for example, the the Japanese, one of the Japanese writing systems is a syllabary. If it had hundreds of different characters, we would say it's a logographic script where each character stands for a word. But since it has only 20 to 25 main characters with a few special symbols, that tells us it's an alphabet. There is no punctuation, but there are spaces between the words, which at least appear to be. And that's good because that gives us information that will become important later since we can tell where the words begin and end. Not all writing systems use that. Some writing systems just run all the letters together And that makes it hard to pick out the words. In fact, that's where we get the Latin word for reading. It's actually for it's actually the same word as picking out, because originally in Latin, all the words just ran together and you had to pick them out. There are a few words in the manuscript that are written in Latin or another European language. 
for example, one section of the manuscript is devoted to the months of the year, and it gives the names of the months in Latin. But these are very few and very far between. Most of it is in this unknown alphabet. And how is the content of the book structured? It's uh, it's basically in six sections. Okay, so let's approach each section uh, individually. What's in the first section? The first section is the longest. It's most of the book, and it's what's called the herbal section, or if you're in England, the herbal section. It contains pictures of plants along with text that apparently talks about the plants. This makes it this section similar to a kind of book that used to be popular called, unsurprisingly, an herbal. An herbal was a book that described different kinds of plants and what you could do with them, like their uses in medicine or magic. But the weird thing about this section is the plants are weird, and none of them is clearly identifiable. There have been some identifications proposed, but they're not as obvious as you would expect them to be. Some of them some of the illustrations of the plant seem to have like the leaves or the flowers of one plant attached to the stems or roots of a different plant. So they're like hybrids. This section also has an illustration at one point of something that looks like a tiny dragon, but that may just be decoration since it otherwise doesn't fit the plant theme. All right. So what's what's in the second section? The second section is known as the astronomical section. It contains pictures of what look like constellations. Some of them also have pictures of the sun, the moon, and other stars. One set of pictures is clearly the signs of the zodiac, starting with Pisces. The last two pages of this section, which would have been Aquarius and Capricorn, are lost, though. So it's only 10 signs from the zodiac. The other pages are missing. Each of the pictures has drawings of 30 women arranged into two or more bands of women. And they're partially nude, and they're either holding stars, or they have stars attached to their arm by a cord of some kind. Okay. Uh, What's in the third section? This is called the biological section. It has lots of text, but it also has some of the most bizarre drawings. Uh, including lots of drawings of nude women. But I should mention, these are very crude drawings, and the women are not made to look attractive. This is not a medieval equivalent of a men's magazine at all. <laughs> they, they, right. They're not drawn attractively. They're very crude. Some of them are wearing crowns, and they seem to be bathing in big tubs filled with a green liquid. The, and the, the fact it's green is significant because... This manuscript also uses blue paint, but these are this is green, so it's not it may not be an ordinary representation of water. The tubs are connected by a weird looking set of pipes that move the green liquid from one tube to another. It seems so when you mentioned the if they intended it to be water, they would have just used the blue paint is what you were saying well, presumably, presumably. although you know sometimes some cultures. If they have a distinction between blue and green, you know, they will typically identify water as blue. Although in Egypt, I know they did have the blue-green distinction, but they still referred to the Mediterranean Sea as the Wajwur, or the Great Green oh. in Egyptian. Well. But that's uh, I think that's just because the way the Mediterranean looks at the mouth of the Nile Delta. Of I, I, I think other water they likely depicted as blue. So that was the third section. What's the fourth section? This one is called the cosmological section. It also has circular diagrams that are kind of like the ones in the astronomical section, but these are harder to figure out. They don't just look like normal constellations. This section also has foldouts, one of which is the six-page foldout that I mentioned, and it has a diagram of what may be a map with islands, roads, castles, and possibly a volcano. All right. What's the fifth section? This one's called the pharmaceutical section. It has labeled drawings of individual parts of plants. So not the whole plant, just parts of it, along with things that look like jars that were used by apothecaries or old-style pharmacists, though some of them, some of the implements look really weird. 
And what's the sixth section? Uh, the sixth section is called the recipes section. And the reason they think it may be recipes is it's almost all text. The text is broken into short paragraphs, like, you know, the steps in a recipe. And each paragraph is marked with a star in the left margin, kind of like the bullet points you might use to list the steps of a recipe. I have to say, this all sounds vaguely like the old Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master Manual I had when I was a kid. Uh huh. Sure. <laughs> but uh, we can get we can come back to to that idea when I, we talk I had about that too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's talk about the theories about this book. This is all a very very strange. So what? What theories are, do people have about this book? Well, they go in, there's a bunch, and they go in different categories. The first category is, you know, what is this book about? What's its subject matter? The next is who wrote it, which would also tell us when it was written. Then there's the way it was written, you know, what's, what's up with this alphabet? And then finally, whether it's meant to be factual or not. So let's, let's take them one by one. What are the theories about this book's subject matter? The first one, I don't know anyone who actually says this, but because the book has these six sections, you could say, well, there is no unifying theme, that it's like six individual treatises that have been bound together. So you've got an herbal treatise, an astronomical treatise, and so forth, but there's no real theme here. Like I said, I don't know, don't know anyone who says that, but it's a possibility. Another theory is this is a medical text. And that medicine is the theme that unites all six of these sections. Some authors, though, have suggested that individual sections of the book may be devoted to other subjects like alchemy or astronomy. So even if you wanted to say a lot of this is medical, some of it may be astronomical, astrological, or alchemical. Then what are the theories about who wrote it and when it was written? So some of the theories propose a nameable individual as the author, and the first one of those is Wilfred Voynich himself, that he wrote it, and it's all a hoax. He's the one that announced this to the public, and he's an antiquarian book dealer, and he's got a background as a pharmacist. So, you know, one of those, this seems to have apothecary type stuff in it. So he was, he was a candidate that's been proposed. Another says that it was by Roger Bacon, who lived in the 1200s. He was an English Franciscan friar, and he was an important theologian. His his nickname, because one of the things that it used to be hip to do was to give theologians nicknames, starting with the word doctor. And he was known as the Doctor Mirabilis, or the miraculous teacher, teacher of the teacher of miracles, something like that. Another possibility from the same time period is St. Albert the Great. He also lived in the 1200s. He was a German Dominican friar and a bishop, and today he's a doctor of the church. So obviously an important theologian. Another suggestion that's been made, given the weird nature of this text, is it might have been written by John Dee, who lived in the 1500s. Uh, He was another Englishman. He was a mathematician, an astronomer, an astrologer, and an occultist. And he did work for Queen Elizabeth I. And if you read the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, you know about the Necronomicon, uh, his fictional book of evil magic. And according, in, in the H.P. Lovecraft Cthulhu Mythos universe, John Dee published an edition of the Necronomicon in English. But that's just fiction. Or at least fiction. partial. That's just fiction. Though. Okay. But John Dee was a real guy. Okay. Another contemporary of John Dee was his partner, a guy named Sir Sir Edward Kelly. He also lived in the 1500s, and he was an occultist and a scryer, which means he was a spirit medium. So those are some of the options. Those are the main named individuals that get proposed. If it wasn't, wasn't written by one of these people, then it was presumably written by an unknown person several centuries ago, at least prior to 1900, but not a clearly defined individual. We may We may know the person have other records of who wrote it, but we haven't connected the Voynich manuscript to that person. You've mentioned two people named Bacon so far. There's for Francis Bacon, which Voynich had the cipher from, and then there's Roger Bacon with someone completely different. Completely different people, yes. Okay, just want to make sure that we've got those separate. So Mm -hmm. what are the theories that deal with the way that it's written? 
There are four basic theories. The first one is it's written in a standard language and it is not in code. So like this would, for example, be Latin or German or something that we're familiar with, not in code, just written in a, in a weird alphabet. So it's in what cri cryptographers would call plain text. That means not encoded. Uh, the second theory is also that it's not in code, but it's in an artificially constructed language like Esperanto or one of Tolkien's Elvish languages or something like that. It's a language that someone made up. You know, Klingon would be another example. It's a language someone made up, but it's not encoded. Then there's the idea, number three, it is written in a standard language like Latin or German or something, but it's in code. And that's why we have trouble reading it. It's not just the alphabet. It's also in code. And then finally, there's the view that it's not written in any standard language, whether artificial or natural. If it's not written in a standard language, then it could be a non-real language that the author knew to be fake, in which case it's a hoax. Or it could be a non-real language that the author believed to be real, like maybe instead of speaking in tongues, they were writing in tongues, but they weren't miraculously endowed with the gift of tongues. They just thought they were. They were. De they were. There was a de a deception of some sort involved, well, whether the, self deception the, or intentional. Yeah, deception. person imagining that this is a real language when really it's not. What are the theories that deal with whether it is meant to be factual? So there's two basic ones, as you would guess. The author meant the work to be factual so that it preserves real information, or the, the author did not believe it to be factual and didn't intend to preserve real information in it. It's just all made up, like it's a fantasy text of some kind, or it's a hoax. So those are the theories. Let's start with the reason perspective, as we do. And the theories about what the book is about, what's our best evidence here? While it could be six treatises with no common theme running among them, that doesn't appear to be the case. There seem to be common elements that run through the six sections, including some kind of progression through the six sections, like they're in a logical order. Similarly, while some elements might deal specifically with alchemy or astrology, even those sections seem to fit in a larger whole. And basically, the best running theory is this is a medical text. That theory explains the most of the data. It explains the herbal section, which looks like a field guide for recognizing plants that you would use in treating people. It explains the astronomical section, because in medieval medicine, you were supposed to take the position of the stars and the planets into account when you treated people, like this drug's going to be effective at this time of year, but not at this other it explains the biological section with the nude bathing women, because bathing, bathing in healing waters was often a way of treating illness. Alternately, the women might be symbols. They might not meant to be literal. They might be symbols representing like internal biological processes or mystical processes of some kind that might be involved in healing. The medical hypothesis will explain the pharmaceutical section with the parts of plants and accompanying text. Uh, since that could be like, okay, after you've recognized the plant and picked it at the right time of year, here's how you process it for treating someone. You know, you grind it up this way or whatever. And then it also explains the recipes section, since that could be how you put all the pieces together and then apply the final treatment to the patient. About the only section that this doesn't, ex that the medical theory doesn't explain is the cosmological one that has the really weird diagrams in it that are sort of astronomical, but not exactly. That, though, it might be about more general principles connecting medicine to like broader cosmological ideas or spiritual principles or something that need to be brought to bear in medicine. Also, since it's almost exclusively women that are depicted in the book, it could be a work on gynecological medicine. This could be an early gynecology textbook. However, it, that might not be the case because if the women are meant symbolically rather than literally, like they seem to be in the astronomical section where they're holding stars or have stars tethered to their wrists, they might just be symbols of some kind. So what can we say about who wrote it and when? 
Well, here we have here we have some. This is one of the things we can figure out pretty well at this point, uh, at least in terms of when. In 2009, the University of Arizona carbon dated several parts of the manuscript, so not just one page, several different parts, and the tests showed that the vellum it's written on was produced between 1404 and 1438. So if you average that, it's around the year 1421 is when the vellum was produced. That eliminates Wilfred Voynich. There's no way that he would have access to a stock of blank vellum, all from the same time period. You know, those all produced at the same time, and it was 500 years ago and nobody had written on it in the intervening half a millennia. Yeah. So that's that's not at all credible. He didn't fake this. Uh, you, you may say, well, wasn't he a pharmacist? Yeah, and that might be precisely why he was interested in this. He thought, hey, maybe early pharmacy textbook this could be an important scholarly discovery. And as a pharmacist, I might be able to crack it. So he's eliminated. The 1421 estimated date also eliminates Roger Bacon and St. Albert the Great because they both lived like 200 years before that. John Dee and Sir Edward Kelly lived about 150 years after the vellum was produced. And it's not impossible that a stock of, say, 300 pages of blank vellum could have survived that long, but it's really unlikely. You know, in, in 150 years, somebody would have written on that vellum. Because vellum was not, it, it's, it's not like paper you go down to the corner store and you buy a, a, a stack of paper. Vellum was ha, was expensive, hard to produce. Yeah. You know, this was all yeah. hand done. Yeah. Yeah. And growing the calves to make the vellum, hundreds of pages of it, that's just the first step. Then you got to like, skin them and tan it and scrape it and all kinds of things. I've seen some fascinating uh, videos on that show how the process goes. And yeah, you, you, you're you not going to make all this vellum and then just leave it sitting around not to be used. So that means that probably none of the proposed authors is correct. And most likely it was written by somebody in the 1400s that we haven't identified. Then how about the way that it's written? There's lots of arguments here, and some of them involve statistics and a technical knowledge of like how co certain codes work and when those codes were invented. Uh, to keep us from getting bogged down, I'm not going to look into the details of the arguments here. I'm going to look at the big picture. So from a big picture view, the text in the Voynich manuscript, as we said, has the right number of characters to be an alphabet rather than a syllabary or a logographic script. One of the things that recent studies under a microscope has shown is that the pen strokes are very fluid, so they don't display forger's tremor. It, you know, if you're writing in some alphabet that's totally new to you, you're going to tend to make a lot of mistakes and be hesitant and stuff. But these are very fluid strokes. So whoever did this was used to writing this way. They did it a lot. This was not their first effort using this alphabet. Also, it's not what you would expect for a person writing a code to have such fluid strokes, because in a code, if you're ciphering this text, you're going to have to be looking back and forth. OK, what letter am I doing now? Because you can't just write fluidly. You have to constantly be checking your cipher key. And consequently, it, it looks like it suggests that it's in plain text, that it's not encoded. It would then either be a standard language or a constructed language with which the author was comfortable, or an unreal language that the author was making up. So those are some of the things about it. Now, we mentioned that the plants are hard to identify, and this fact would be consistent with more than one view. One is they might be hard to identify because they're part of a visual code an attempt to keep the information private. Because, uh, for example, you might say, ooh, I want to use the leaves of this plant with the flowers of this other plant, and I will know that it's only the flowers that are important. The leaves are like misdirection from someone trying to get this. So they could be part of a visual code attempting to keep information private. Also, the, the plants might be hard to identify just because it's a fantasy document. You know, it's about some imaginary world with these imaginary plants. Like the D&D &D, uh, Dungeon Master's Manual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
if it was in an unreal language, then the auth then whether or not the author believed it to be real, we would expect it to violate the statistical patterns that real languages have. These include things like how long words are. And the words in the Voynich manuscript are of a believable length, and their variation is believable compared to other natural languages, natural and artificial ones. Cert also, certain characters in the Voynich manuscript like always go together or never go together. And this is also a phenomenon that um, that normal languages display. In English, for example, we never have the sound represented by PS on the front of a word. We don't say psychology. We say psychology because English doesn't allow a P before an S sound on the front of a word but it will allow exactly that sound on the end of a word, like in lips or flops or steps. And so the Voynich Manuscripts dis displays the same kind of character combinations, where it's like, okay, these two are not allowed together on the front of a word, but they are allowed on the back of a word. Those would be, but, in, but when written, you would see P.S., but maybe in like English, yeah. in English. So maybe like you would you would hear PZ in in a word, but you'd never see it written PZ at the beginning of a word. Uh, you'd might you'd see them together in in the word. That might be mm -hmm. even more connected to a written manuscript. Yeah. Oh, I, I hesitated using the PS example in English for this reason that could yeah get a little confusing but it's also one of the best ones because it, is, it does it occur is. at the end of a word right it's you're it's an analogy uh that you're making which i, th I think maybe the listeners can can uh, understand that so that's yeah that's, so that's good okay yeah the the point is the voynich manuscripts does the expected things that other languages do with what characters are allowed next to each other in what circumstances of course there also seems to be a grammar covering how words are formed out of smaller parts uh, there seems to be a grammar on how words relate to each other in sentences, and often also how often words repeat and in what contexts. So basically, the Voynich manuscript does display statistical patterns that are similar to real languages, and that codes or ciphers don't display, and also that random text, like you might make up if you were faking it all, random text would not display these. In 2013, a paper was published called Probing the Statistical Properties of Unknown Texts, Application to the Voynich Manuscript. And we'll have a link to this in the show notes. But I'll, I want to read you the abstract of the conclusions that these uh, researchers came to. They said, in this study, we propose a framework for determining whether a text, for example, written in an unknown alphabet, is compatible with a natural language and to which language it could belong. The approach is based on three types of statistical measurements, i.e., obtained from first-order statistics of word properties in a text, from the topology of complex networks representing texts, and from the intermittency concepts where text is treated as a time series. That means like looking at how frequently stuff recurs and when. They go on, comparative experiments were performed with the New Testament in 15 different languages and with distinct books in English and Portuguese in order to quantify the dependency of the different measurements on the language and on the story being told in the book. The metrics found to be informative in distinguishing real texts from their shuffled versions include assortativity, degree, and selectivity of words. Now, here's the money quote. As an illustration, we analyzed an undeciphered medieval manuscript known as the Voynich Manuscript. We show that it is mostly compatible with natural languages and incompatible with random texts. So that would support the idea this is a real language, not just, not just uh, gobbledygook. It would e then either be a natural language or a constructed, constructed language. But if it was a natural language, and this is where I'm starting to speculate more, I mean, a lot of this is speculation, but I'm speculating even more here. 
if it was a natural language written in plain text, but so not encoded, but just in a strange alphabet, we should have been able to crack it by now. Because a lot of people have been trying this, have been running all kinds of studies. For purposes of comparison, there were a, uh, a couple of scripts we found in the Mediterranean area known as Linear A and Linear B. And for a long time, these weren't cracked, but they cracked Linear B, and it turns out it's Greek. It's just written in a different script. Linear A, because of where we found it, is also quite likely to be in Greek or another known language from that area, but we haven't cracked it. And the only reason we haven't cracked Linear A is because all of the examples we have would fit on two pages of standard type. So we have very little Linear A data to work with. By comparison, the Voynich manuscript is vastly larger. We've got around 240 pages of this stuff with associated pictures that'll help us understand what's in the text. So we have enough, if it's just an unusual script for Latin or some other well-known language, we should have cracked it by now and we haven't. That suggests it may well be a constructed language. The constru idea of a constructed language also fits with being written in a weird script, because if you're going to make up a language, you may want to make up a script to go with it. Um, Tolkien did that with his Tang War script, for example. But the conclusion that I proposed here, that it's uh, a constructed language, it isn't certain. This could be a natural language in plain text or in code, or it could be a non-real language. But a constructed language is what a big picture look at the evidence suggests to me. And if that's right, then the author must have been very familiar with it to be able to write so fluidly. Uh, he must have used this constructed language a lot, either alone or with a small community of language users. Kind of like Klingon is today. Yes. Yes, there is actually a Klingon language institute with people who use it. So does this tell us anything about whether the book is meant to be factual? Well, maybe. If the text is in a constructed language, then the author meant it to preserve information. Uh, the information would then either be factual in the author's mind or fictitious in the author's mind. Most people who would use a constructed language would use it to preserve factual information, I would suppose. However, J.R.R. Tolkien allegedly, according to one story I've heard, was tempted to write Lord of the Rings in a constructed language. You know, he was a philologist. This is what he was doing for fun. He made up languages. And according to one story I've been told, he was going to write Lord of the Rings that way. Um, ultimately, though, he decided not to because it would have rather severely limited the readership of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> also, Lord of the Rings is a story. It has a narrative. The Voynich manuscript doesn't have a narrative. It looks like a medical textbook. Why would you write a fictional medical textbook in a constructed language? I can imagine someone writing a fantasy medical textbook in gibberish. But why would you do that in a, lang in, a, in a language you've constructed? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, so I think it's unlikely that someone would use a constructed, a constructed language to encode a fantasy book with no narrative. If the constructed language theory is correct, then I think it's most likely to contain factual information. In other words, it's a real medical text. That then would raise the question of why this constructed language I guess it could be because the, I mean, maybe it's some kind of spiritual language and the practitioner who wrote this thought that was appropriate for the medical principles he was writing. But a more common explanation would be it's in a constructed language to keep it private. This is for the author's own use or maybe like his students or something. Note that the constructed languages that we're familiar with tend to have a code-like property in that most people can't read them, but they don't require you to encode each individual character or word if you know the language. So like if, you, if you've taught yourself Klingon or maybe gone to Klingon language camp, you can then speak Klingon fluidly. You don't have to look it up word by word if you've really learned it well. 
but other people won't be able to read it. And so it's a way of keeping information private without the problem of using a code where you have to go letter by letter or word by word to encrypt it. That also means when it comes time to retrieve the information, the text you've written, if you know this language, you just have to read it. You don't have to get a key and laboriously decipher it all again. So a constructed language would be a good way of achieving some of the same effects as a code in keeping information private without the laborious encoding and decoding process. But uh, as I said, it's not necessarily true that the constructed language hypothesis is the case. And if it's wrong, then the conclusion wouldn't follow. If it's an unreal language and the author knew that to be the case, then this could be a scam document. Like, hey, I got this secret ancient medical text for you to buy. Or it could just be a fantasy document that some rich person made for themselves to imagine. So that's the reason perspective. What is the faith perspective on the Voynich Manuscript? Well, until we can read it, we won't really know if it has faith significance. Um, It certainly won't reveal any new truths about the faith, but it might tell us about the religious beliefs of a person or a group living in the 1400s. So it could have some faith interest from that angle. And Jimmy, what's your bottom line then on the Voynich Manuscript? It appears to have been written by an unknown author in the 1400s. It appears to be a medical text meant to preserve factually accurate information, not saying it would agree with modern medical science, but information the author believed factual. And while I can't be certain, and while I would love for us to decode it, a preliminary look at the evidence on my part suggests it may be written in in a constructed language with deliberately obscure plant illustrations to keep the information it contains on a proprietary basis. It would, I would love to find to have some sort of historical or archaeological find that, that finds the Rosetta Stone equivalent for the Voynich Manuscript, some yeah. other document by this author that reveals the secret, but uh, uh, that's, that's for the future, apparently. So what are our uh, further resources we can offer to listeners on the Voynich Manuscript? Well, there's a complete scan of the Voynich Manuscript on the Internet Archive, so we'll have a link to that. Uh, We'll also have a link to Wikipedia on the Voynich Manuscript. On Amazon Prime, there's a documentary called The Voynich Code, which you can watch if you have Amazon Prime. You can watch it for free. I also have a link to Yale University's homepage for the manuscript, and also a link to that article whose abstract I read, Probing the Statistical Properties of Unknown Texts, applications to the Voynich, application to the Voynich Manuscript. Excellent. Uh, That's a fascinating story. I hope we have more to come on this uh, from from, uh, those who are studying it in the future. Yeah. Folks, I want to just mention that uh, right now we're we're inserting this bit of audio in because after we recorded this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on the Voynich Manuscript, some news came out in the media about the Voynich Manuscript so we wanted to make sure we got this out there from Jimmy uh, while you're listening to this so that you're not we're not waiting to the feedback episode. So, Jimmy, what what happened? Well, basically, every it seems like every year someone comes out claiming to have cracked the Voynich manuscript. And then there's pushback from scholars saying, eh, actually, you didn't. And that happened again this year while we were after we recorded it. But before we released this episode, a guy in England came out, said, "Ooh, in just two weeks. I cracked this thing that linguists have been working on for decades, and turns out the Voynich Manuscript is like a medical text dealing with women's health. It's like, no, duh, that's what everyone agrees. And it's written in something called proto-romance. It's the, like the root of modern romance languages like French and Italian and, and so forth. So within 24 hours, as I predicted, there was pushback. People saying, actually, proto-romance isn't a thing. And this was something that I immediately, you know, so we know what proto-romance was. It's called Latin. That's all of those languages evolved from Latin. And there could be a dialect that had never been recorded because it wasn't literary enough. In fact, there's even a parallel to that in the New Testament. Uh, The New Testament is not written in classical Greek. And so scholars would say, hey, this is not this doesn't sound like Plato or Aristophanes. Maybe it's the idea was for a while, maybe this is some kind of Holy Ghost Greek that God came up with because it's not like the established version of the language. Well, then we dug up 
all of the stuff that ordinary people had written via archaeology, turns out, nope, this is the way everybody talked. This was the non-literary Koine Greek. Koine just means common. And so this was the New Testament's written in common Greek, not literary Greek. And hypothetically, you could say, well, maybe there was the same thing with proto-French and proto-Italian and proto-Spanish. Maybe there was a kind of non-literary dialect that didn't get written down. But that's kind of a stretch. And so scholars very quickly pointed out, this doesn't fit what we know about European history. And so there was a bunch of pushback on, no, some British guy has not in two weeks solved what everyone's been working on for decades. So hopefully uh, we will crack it, but that's the present state of affairs. And because we knew that you would have encountered some of these stories about it being cracked, just wanted to give you an update on that. And now back to the show. So let's talk about our mysterious feedback from our listeners. We've got a lot of great feedback from uh, our Resurrection of Jesus episode. Lucia Deloach says, The advanced tech idea has no weight whatsoever since that time and people were not anywhere near the level of tech advancement. What do you say to that, Jimmy? So what we're referring to are are some kind of fringe explanations for the resurrection, like maybe aliens came down and and, you know, repaired Jesus's body and raised him from the dead, or maybe it was time travelers, or maybe Jesus was a time traveler, or maybe Jesus was an alien or stuff like that. One way or another, trying to explain the resurrection and the ascension by advanced technology. And uh, Lucia or Lucia is clearly correct that people at the time on Earth didn't have such tech, and so they couldn't have used it. But people today can imagine this as an explanation and would say, well, maybe they didn't have the tech here on Earth. Maybe they did somewhere else and they came and did it. So I don't think that this is at all plausible. You have to, I mean, you can speculate anything you want, but if you're following the evidence, it does not point to this. So I wouldn't dismiss the idea on based on the fact no one on Earth had that tech at the time. I would dismiss it based on the fact that's not where the evidence points. As that famous internet meme says, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And the, Mo- and then, moderns, t- moderns tend to have that reaction. <laughs> right. Uh, and then a user and one date uh, on YouTube says, if Jesus just passed out on the cross, that would mean he was essentially asleep on the cross. If he was asleep on the cross, wouldn't he have asphyxiated almost immediately if the asphyxiation theory of death is true? Yes, he would have. If you pass out, you can't physically raise yourself up to keep breathing, and he would have died very quickly. The The reason I didn't go into that in the episode is, number one, to keep the episode from going way huge long. Because, I mean, people have written books about this, and I might write a book about it someday where I go into every conceivable possibility and every little bit of evidence but you know, I needed to keep the episode short. Also, the asphyxiation theory is not necessarily correct. There have been studies done that show you actually can breathe pretty well on a cross, especially if your arms are tied to it, in addition to or instead of being simply nailed to it. And a lot and that was common to have arms tied, whether or not with nails. So I I also didn't mention it because it's not certain he would have asphyxiated if he had gone unconscious. I, I'm going to butcher this uh, YouTube user's name here. Um, I think it might he, be... He's a, written to us before. Yeah, it, so I guess I'm going to try it again. Mao Xiaok Lan says on YouTube, thanks for this great episode. Although I am a Catholic and a believer in the resurrection of Jesus, one counter argument that I'm surprised not to have encountered is that the disciples did have one worldly benefit from, stick, benefit from sticking to their story prestige as leaders of the new community, even if the gospel accounts are often unflattering to them. Has anyone ever made or answered this objection? Sure. And it is something that is a possibility. I mean, we mentioned they didn't seem to get money or sex, which are the normal two big rewards for being a leader in a in a religious group like, like that. Uh, you know, someone starts their own religious group. They tend to get one of those two things if they're scamming, if they're not sincere. And prestige is another reward, but as Mao Seklan points out, they are not portrayed in a particularly flattering way in the documents that they and their own disciples wrote. And so that tends to take some of the edge off of off of some of their prestige. 
also they you know were told by Jesus and record, recorded this in the gospels that they are not to be high and mighty and they are to be servants of others and why why would they keep experiencing all of the hardships that they encountered including martyrdom if all they got was a little bit of prestige but they knew the story was all fake and they were making it up right at some point you just say okay we were just making it up don't don't crucify us don't kill us we're going to renounce it because you know i mean that yeah. that seems like the logical okay bennett says on facebook Great podcast, lots of great information on the not really dead proposal. I used to play for church services in the lo local prison church services. Uh, Stacy Keach and Oscar Wilde were inmates in the past. The preacher at these services used to evangelize with a similar sermon to your great podcast, but obviously more briefly. His final point he had for not really dead or a miracle was that he was seen up and walking around a few days after having nails hammered through his ankle bones. And that is a good point. The, or at least through his ankles or through his feet, that is a detail that is attested in the New Testament. And you're not going to be walking within a few days after that happens to you. No. Like, this is another one where I didn't go into it simply for reasons of length. But if I ever write a book about this, that'll go in there. Stephen writes via email. I was talking to an agnostic friend about the resurrection episode. Here are his own words. And this is the quote. Jimmy basically stated the exact thing I have a problem with. He said, essentially, if it's not X or Y, it must be Z, which isn't a valid line of reasoning because it assumes you're considering all possible outcomes that the goal is to prove Z, not disprove X and Y. Disproving X and Y does not get you to proving Z. It doesn't work that way. The only way that is a, that is a valid point is if literally the only possibilities are X, Y, and Z. There are so many possibilities that we couldn't even know about. So we can't limit the scope to say it must have been X, Y, or Z, and X and Y are not true, therefore Z. What are your thoughts on this, Jimmy? I appreciate what Stephen's agnostic friend is saying, but I have to disagree with it because if you accept that principle, it's going to undermine all, I, I have to think about it before saying all, but vast swaths of human knowledge would instantly vanish because you couldn't, there are always other possibilities that have not been envisioned. Even re extremely remote ones. Even extremely remote ones. So you could say, okay, the fact that the sun comes up in the morning is not due to gravity. It's because invisible gnomes push it up. Or it's because Apollo is driving his chariot and pulling it along. Or because, the, uh, because Apophis spit it out and it's flying across the sky as a result. Or it's actually not a sun at all. It's aliens in a UFO that's concealed in a vast plasma field, and they're piloting the sun. You, you can make up an infinite number of explanations for anything. And so what happens in logical discourse is you then define a uni what's called a universe of discourse, which is the set of possibilities that you are considering. And even though it's possible there are other explanations for something that are outside of the universe of discourse, you for just because we can't adjudicate an infinite number of possible explanations, you form your universe of discourse around the most plausible ones and then work within that. And so uh, that's what I'm doing when it comes to the resurrection. I even broaden the universe of discourse to look at some that are frankly very implausible, like time travelers or aliens did it. You know, I try to be generous in terms of the universe of discourse. I explore the mysterious universe of discourse. <laughs> but it's true, there are an infinite number of other explanations, but that's not just true of the resurrection, that's true of everything. And if you say, I can't use process of elimination to navigate a universe of discourse because there are other possibilities outside the universe of discourse, you say that here and you're consistent with that principle, you're not going to be able to use process of elimination for anything. And so pick your favorite scientific theory. There are an infinite number of other possible explanations for what it is. You won't be able to narrow it down to the one you personally believe in. Right. There's lots of science out there that can't, the, the, our explanation can't be proven except by disproving all the other plausible explanations. Right. And that's, in fact, how, how inductive science proceeds is by can we 
Can we eliminate a possibility here? It's often how medicine works. They don't diagnosis is eliminating all of the plausible explanations for why your symptoms are there and coming up with uh, watch watch house. <laughs> I was just going to say think, think horses, not zebras. <laughs> exactly, exactly. When you hear hoof beats. <laughs> all right. What are our mysterious headlines this week, Jimmy? So uh, speaking of witnessing and people dying, we have a, a story that I've linked from the last witness who saw Hitler alive, who is himself still alive. Uh, he was a young serviceman in the German army in 1945 when, according to the story, Hitler committed suicide in Der Fuhrer bunker. And interestingly, in this story, he says it's not at all like it was in the movies. The actual Fuhrer bunker was tiny and had just a, like maybe five people in it. And the much bigger things you see in the movies are based on a different bunker that Hitler actually wasn't in at the end. So you can read about that. And of course, in the future, we'll have an episode talking about did Hitler really die or not? This guy says he saw him dead, but could have been a body double. Also, I have a link to an article on live science called Why Is This Viral Image of Unrecognizable Objects So Creepy? <laughs> and one of the things that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft mentions in one of his stories, it's called The Thing at the Doorstep. Uh, this guy has a wife who is a who is a magician, and she goes to other dimensions and brings back these inexplicable objects. You can't tell what any of them are or what they're for. And that's one of the creepy elements in the story. Well, recently on Twitter, somebody posted a picture of some objects with the text, name any object in this picture. And you look at it, and it's like, what are these things? I mean, one of them, it looks kind of like a teddy bear, but it's you look closer and it's not a teddy bear. You look at all these different objects and they're just bizarre. And so Live Science has an article about why people find that creepy. Yeah. It, they also have a picture yeah. of the picture. Yeah, it's it's not just that it's inexplicable. It just gives you a weird feeling looking at it. I have to I have to say, looking at it right now makes me uncomfortable, so I'm not going to look at it anymore. But go check okay. it out. <laughs> <laughs> so... Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? It's going to be about the Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting. This was the sighting in 1947 that kicked off the modern UFO era. It all goes back to this guy and what he saw while he was flying his plane in Washington State. And there's more to this story than you might suppose. Ooh, I'm looking forward to that. Before we finish up, folks, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Simon M., Father Eric, Kathy L., Linda N., and Janet M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give, and we would be very grateful for your support. It would show that how much you enjoy the show and want to see it continue. So that's it from us. What did you think of the Voynich Manuscript? Let us know what your theories are, what you think of what Jimmy's uh, explanations of the theories were by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page and leave us some feedback. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world uh, or use the hashtag mysterious feedback, all one word, no spaces or anything like that. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. Once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.